Thank you so much uh, for sharing my uh, amateur enthusiasm for biblical archaeology and turning up to this talk so that I can actually give a talk in person for the first time in about two and something years, uh, having been uh, stuck uh, behind uh, my computer camera in my little flat in Southampton uh, during uh, the, uh, the COVID crisis. So it's a real pleasure, uh, particularly uh, today, to, to be with you uh, for this subject of archaeological evidence and Jesus. Now, it can't have escaped your notice that we live in an age of uninformed criticism claims about Jesus. For example, um, Victor Stenger uh, said that Jesus probably didn't exist. Um, Richard Dawkins, uh, another of the new atheists, uh, said that the Gospels are basically works of fiction. Or Dan Brown, although some years ago now, still sort of in the cultural memory, uh, claimed that the, the idea of a divine Jesus was an innovation decided upon at the Council of Nicaea, which happened in 325 AD. Now, all of these claims are nonsense, uh, but they get uh, cultural spread because of who says it, uh, and the fact that people are uninformed, including the people who say these things. Uh, about the relevant evidence. Now, of course, there's lots of relevant evidence that we could go to of a literary kind, particularly, of course, within the New Testament. However, it's interesting to see what we can do simply by turning to the study of archaeology, that is, the, the systematic study of the material remains of past human behavior. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on those material remains. I will include some texts that are on solid objects. I'm going to allow myself that luxury. So inscriptions, for example. Um, but I'm going to ignore uh, what we would normally think of as the, the kind of written text, texts on parchment and so on. Now, if there's one sort of overall argument that I'm mounting here, it's summarized nicely by this. Uh, quote uh, from the American philosopher Lydia McGrew, who makes this nice kind of analogy for this argument. And she says, if you sampled a loaf of bread on, on both ends and at several points in the middle, and you find that it's, it's good to eat, it would be cavailing, that would, it would be being far too skeptical, overly skeptical to say that, well, perhaps just the parts you haven't tasted yet happen to be the moldy bits. You've got a loaf of bread, you've tested it in a random sample, it, it's good, you're probably good to go. You should relax and just enjoy your meal, right? Well, it's a bit like that with the claims made in the New Testament, the claims made by Christianity that we can test against the archaeology. Those are not all the claims, but it's a fair spread of claims. And so the more of those claims we get validated from the archaeological record, the more we can kind of infer overall that the, the Gospels, the New Testament, that Christianity gives us uh, at least a fairly reliable report of what's going on because where we've been able to test it, it's proven itself reliable. I'm gonna break this down into three sections, and I'll actually, I'll pause after each of these sections briefly, see if you have any questions on the material. And then the, uh, the folks who are doing the video editing can decide whether to edit it all together into one long video or chop it up into three short ones or whatever they want. So we'll look at historical places, such as cities, individual buildings, uh, historical people. Uh, we can look at general and even specific names of people, uh, their titles, even their relationships to each other. And uh, historical culture, 
uh, the general background culture described in the New Testament, and even uh, people's beliefs in history. So starting with historical places. Start at the beginning with Bethlehem. This is a very large picture of a very small object. It would be about the size of your thumbnail. It's a seal impression. And uh, archaeologist Eddie Sukron describes it. He says, here we can read the word Bethlehem in a clear Hebrew inscription from the first temple period on a, a bula, one of these little seal impressions, found in Israel that arrived from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, maybe about paying some tax on some goods. It's kind of things like, yep, stamp, you've paid your taxes on, on these goods. This is the Bethlehem next to Jerusalem referred to in the Bible. Or Nazareth, where uh, Jesus grew up. Um, some skeptics had claimed that um, we didn't have evidence of Bethlehem's existence during the sort of general time period of the New Testament, only before and, and after. Similarly, they claim that we didn't really have good evidence for the existence of Nazareth. But uh, here from 2010, um, again, the, the excavation director describing the, the discovery. Uh, the discovery is one of the utmost importance since it reveals for the very first time a house from the Jewish village of Nazareth and thereby sheds light on the way of life at the time of Jesus. The building that we found is small and modest, most likely typical of the dwellings in Nazareth in that period. They even say this may well have been a place that Jesus and his contemporaries were familiar with. It's a logical suggestion. There are 16 references to Capernaum in the Gospels. Jesus taught in the synagogue there, for example, according to Mark 1, 21 to 22 and Luke 4, 31 to 36. Well, here we have a, a photograph of the synagogue in ancient Capernaum, that the white stone that you can see here is from the third stroke fourth century synagogue in ancient Capernaum. But the black basalt foundation stones at the bottom are generally thought to be the foundation stones of the synagogue from the first century, from the time of Jesus. It's just that they rebuilt over it later, but they reused the foundations. Also in Capernaum, Peter's house, or what's called Peter's house. Um, it's the remains in Capernaum were found of an, an octagonal 5th century church. And in 1968, archaeologists discovered the remains of a 4th century church underneath that 5th century church. And they discovered that the 4th century church had been built around a 1st century house, which had clearly been used as a Christian meeting place since about the second half of the 1st century. And there were signs like things that were scratched into the plaster work of one of the, one of the rooms there. And it's interesting to note that in the 4th century, um, the emperor's mother, Emperor Constantine's mother, Agira, kind of went on the first kind of pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And um, she describes uh, in Capernaum, the house of the Prince of the Apostles, which would be Peter, uh, has been made into a church with its original walls still standing. It's where the Lord cured the paralytic. So that seems to fit in with this archeological discovery of this kind of like, Petrushka doll type arrangement of churches built upon older and older churches back to the first century. This is not a photograph of first century Jerusalem. It's a picture of a computer graphic representation of first century Jerusalem. Um, but we know quite a lot about what first century Jerusalem would have looked like uh, from the archeological record. Uh, here's something that is uh, real. A uh, fairly recent discovery, this was 2004, uh, where they were doing some uh, works in Jerusalem on the drains and they stumbled across uh, the first century ritual bathing pool of Siloam, mentioned in John 9, 1 to 7. 
uh, engineers uncovered these uh, series of ancient steps, and uh, we've got a square of steps uh, leading down to what would have been the bathing pool um, during some pipe maintenance near the mouth of, um, you might know, have heard of, this is Old Testament archaeology, but Hezekiah's Tunnel from the Old Testament. The water from Hezekiah's Tunnel flows into uh, the Pool of Siloam. Um, you can see here the, uh, the steps leading down, and there's even some you know, rainwater or whatever collected here at the bottom. Um, water flowing here still. Um, and the sort of the size of the thing, uh, gauging from the people here. Uh, and this is interesting because this, this has to do with how they date these things. You know, when you unearth stuff, you can look at pottery and the way that pottery changes over time, and that helps archaeologists to, to date things. And coins are great because people tend to stamp dates on coins, uh, like year whatever of my reign, uh, Herod, and, and then you can kind of date to, well, this must have been buried after that coin was minted, right? So it, it gives you sort of bookmarks for the, for the dating. We will move on to looking at the category of historical people. And this is a great passage to go to from Luke's Gospel in this regard. This is Luke 3, verses 1 to 2, because it mentions, Luke is putting into historical context for his readership what he's talking about. So he mentions particular historical figures that would have been known in order to locate what he's describing in his biography of Jesus. And he says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch, that is a governor of a quarter of a Roman province, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Trachonotitis, whom Josephus mentions in Jewish antiquities, uh, and Licinius, tetrarch of Albany, doing the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Talking about John the Baptist. And we can, we can get, so I've already mentioned one who we've got a literary reference for that I can't really include because I'm talking about archaeology. But one, Tiberius Caesar. Here's a bust of him. Here's some of his coins. Uh, we can say, yeah, uh, we can date him. Uh, this is a Tiberius Denarius from 14 to 37 AD, uh, commonly referred to as the tribute penny um, from the Bible. From, you know, the story about who's, who do your taxes belong to, uh, the coin shows a portrait of Tiberius Caesar. Accurate or not, who knows, yeah? Or uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, discovered in 1961 at Caesarea Maritime in Israel. This so-called Pilate stone um, had actually been reused, and it was found in, just as a bit of rubble in another building since its, its heyday. Um, but they actually noticed that on this bit of rubble was this Latin inscription from the first century AD uh, about a Tiberium, that is a, a temple to Tiberius, a Tiberium from Tius Pilatus Ectus. Um, now, I'm saying it that way because you can see bits of the words are missing, have been chipped off by the rough and tumble of, of history but it doesn't take much to piece this together as clearly saying this is a Tiberium, you know, uh, sponsored by Pontius Pilate. You know, please give me kudos, emperor. Aren't I a goody two shoes? I paid for this temple for you. Give me brownie points. Um, and then later on, you know, when that wasn't significant anymore, people reused it in, an, in another building. But it, it, it mentions Pontius Pilate as the prefect. Uh, and where it was discovered, of course, is, is significant as well. Much more recently, this is from 2018, the so-called Pilot Ring. 2018, scientists announced that, that a seal ring, a ring that will be used for making a seal impression, uh, was excavated. They'd actually excavated it in the 1960s, but had only now recognized what it was as going through the finds. It takes a long time to go through archaeological finds and to publish about them and so on. Uh, this has been discovered at Herodium, uh, and it carries the inscription, uh, 
of, you know, of belonging to Pilatus. Uh, the Greek letters set around uh, a picture of a wine vessel. Um, Pilato represents the, the dative form of the name, which would ordinarily be uh, written in, in slightly different type of letters, minuscule letters, uh, a little bit differently. Um, the inscription's on a corroded copper alloy ring. Uh, it was finally read, made out, you know, what this inscription was using advanced photographic techniques that, you know, wouldn't have been available in the 1960s. So they, they kind of, even if they'd looked at it in the 1960s, you know, they couldn't have noticed what it was because they couldn't have read the inscription. It was too difficult to make out without modern technique. Uh, I'm afraid I can't tell you what that technique is, but there we go. Now, they reckon that the ring's probably not fancy enough to have actually been worn by Pilate himself. Rather, it was likely worn by someone who was authorized to act on Pilate's behalf, on his authority, probably one of his slaves. Uh, he would use this seal to make official communications, um, maybe about Pilate's wine cellars, or you know, since there's a wine vessel on it, or maybe that's just decorative, who knows. Herod the Great, uh, Thomas Paine, a uh, skeptic, 18th century, said there could be no such person as a King Herod, because the Jews and their country were then under the dominion of the Roman emperors, who governed them by tetrarchs or governors. So there couldn't have been a King Herod. Here's a coin from uh, Herod the Great. Um, it's a bronze coin. And on, on the obverse side at the bottom is a tripod, picture of a tripod, a ceremonial bowl, and the inscription, Herod, King. <laughs> and the year that the coin was struck, year three of Herod's reign, uh, so that puts this in 37 BC. And it says on there, Herod, King. In 1996, Israeli professor of archaeology, Echad Netzer, discovered some broken pottery in Masada, bearing the Latin inscription, Herod, the great king of the Jews, or king of Judea. This is the first uh, find to mention the full biblical title of King Herod. This was part of a, an amphora, a, a vessel used for the transportation of liquids, probably wine, again, uh, dated to about uh, 19 BC. And that'll be by things like the type of pottery and also the type of lettering on it, because script, again, changes over time. And that uh, allows you to, um, to date some things by what kind of lettering is being used. Uh, fourth, Licinius. Now, some scholars have said, look, Luke doesn't know what he's talking about here, clearly, because everybody knew that Licinius wasn't a tetrarch. He was the ruler of Calchas half a century earlier than Luke was talking about. But an inscription was later found from the time of Tiberius, uh, 14 to 37 AD, which names one Licinius as Tetrarch in Albia near Damascus. Uh, so there'd been two different government officials who'd had the same name. You know, what are the odds? Um, Presumably not all that bad. <laughs> Fifth, uh, Caiaphas. Uh, this is the, the ossuary, is the technical name for this, the bone box. You know, the Jews would bury someone, let the flesh decay for a while, gather up the bones, put them in a bone box, an ossuary. Uh, this was discovered in a tomb located in the south of Jerusalem uh, with several different ossuaries. Um, one of which many historians believe relates to the former high priest Caiaphas and his family. Um, it, you can see it's very ornate, it's somebody very rich, very well off, and on the side and back of the ossuary, there's it, inscribed into uh, the ossuary uh, Caiaphas' name. It mentions Yosef Bar, that is son of Caiaphas. Uh, here is, now, I'm going to take this with a pinch of salt, and so here is possibly the bone box of John the Baptist, a discovery from 2011. Um, 
I'm sorry if I uh, ruin the uh, chief archaeologist's name here, but uh, Pop Konstantinov headed an archaeological team that uncovered the, the reliquary or ancient container for relics uh, in which eight bone pieces attributed to John the Baptist were found. This reliquary was found, it was embedded inside an altar in the ruins of a monastery on Sveti Island, a small island in the Black Sea uh, off uh, Bulgaria. Uh, Professor Pop, Pop Konstantinov told the media that he based his support for the find's authenticity on a Greek inscription that was found on another box that was found with the reliquary. There were several boxes here. And the inscription in Greek said, God save your servant Thomas to St. John, June 24. Now, June 24 is the date of the religious feast of St. John the Baptist. And the island's name and the monastery this was found in dedicated to St. John. And that's considered supporting evidence as well. Now, of course, we all know about medieval frauds of saints' bones, and you know, you put them all together and you end up with like three-armed St. Peter and, and so on. Because you, you get tourist income, basically, if your monastery has some really valuable bones, right? Brings in the punters. You can fix the roof. Well, Oxford University archaeologists undertook some carbon dating tests, talking about carbon dating on some of the bones found in this reliquary. And the research team dated the right-handed knuckle bone to the middle of the first century AD, when John is believed to have lived until his beheading ordered by King Herod. They did find that some of the bones were not human. <laughs> so someone along the way had at least bulked up the collection with a few horse bones or whatever. Um, but again, another indication that maybe there's something to this particular reliquary. But let me give you three additional names that I'm much uh, more uh, secure in talking about, I think, from this ossuary, which you can tell just from looking at it, would belong to someone much um, poorer than the Caiaphas family. Uh, it's a mid-first century chalk ossuary, uh, noticed in 2002, I say noticed because it was found in a collection in an antiques shop. Uh, this wasn't, you know, dug up by archaeologists in situ, which led to a bit of humming and hawing about whether it was genuine or not. Um, but this um, collector who had them in his, his shop seemed to have had it for a long time and not really have made anything of it. It was someone else who noticed the inscription and the potential significance of it. Because the inscription um, running from uh, right to left here, of course, is Yachob Bar Joseph. Achered Yeshua, which is um, Yachob, Bar, son of Yosef, Joseph, brother of Achered Yeshua, Jesus, Jacob James, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Of course, James, we know, was martyred in about 62 AD, 29 years after Jesus' crucifixion, I would say, which would date this ossuary to AD 63 at the earliest, um, which fits in with the dating. A 2014 peer-reviewed paper in the Open Journal of Geology supported the authenticity of the the James Ossery and the inscription, the full inscription in it. Um, patina or, or um, detritus that's built up, dirt and so on that builds up over time on finds. The patina on the Ossery surface matched that in, inside the engravings. And microfossils in the inscription were, were naturally uh, deposited. Uh, this is uh, just a, a screen grab of the paper. It's online, open journal, access journal. So if you want to read the paper on the authenticity of James Ossery in the Open Journal of Geology 2014, issue 4, 
uh, by Amnon Rosenfeld et al. You, you can do that. Herschel Shanks, uh, he, he died um, fairly recently, but he was editor-in-chief of the Biblical Archaeological Review. Uh, he said, this box is more likely the ossuary of James, the brother of Jesus of Nazareth, than not. In my opinion, it's likely that this inscription does mention the James and Joseph and Jesus of the New Testament. Likewise, um, American historian Paul L. Mayer says there's strong, though not absolute, cl absolutely conclusive, evidence that yes, the ossuary and its inscription are not only authentic, but that the inscribed names are the New Testament personalities. Part of that is that the statistics of the combination of names and the fact that it was, it was unusual to mention you know, your brother. Um, that suggests that the person's brother was thought to be someone significant, to be worth mentioning. You would usually mention, you know, I'm the son of so-and-so, if you're talking about your family history. Okay, let's press on to our, our third and final section about historical culture, about just very briefly I'll touch on biblical kind of general background culture with one example, and then I'll look at the issue of beliefs, particularly about people's beliefs about Jesus and responding to that sort of Dan Brown claim about ideas about Jesus being divine were, were fourth century claims. Here's a first century fishing boat. Uh, in 1986, Israel suffered a drought which caused the waters of the Sea of Galilee to recede, uncovering in the mud of the, 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 what had been the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, this uh, boat which they had to rush to rescue before the fact that it had been uncovered sort of did, made the whole thing collapse. Um, so it was a, a bit of an archeological kind of rescue uh, story. Two local fishermen who were also happened to be amateur archeologists stumbled across this and kind of called in the, the experts to rescue it. Uh, a well-preserved fishing boat from the time of Jesus. The vessel, which measured over 27 feet in length, was, uh, they reckon, typical of fishing boats used during this time in the Eastern Mediterranean. Probably have other examples of Eastern Mediterranean boats. Uh, they raced against time to recover the boat from the mud and put it in a museum and preserve it before the, the waters returned and kind of drowned the archeologists, you know, a bit of a fight against the clock. Um, pots, you know, pottery, and lamps found beside the boat helped to date it to the first century. And this was confirmed by our old friend radiocarbon dating, uh, because wood, so you've got, you've got um, organic matter. Uh, in the back of the boat, it's interesting to note, was a raised section in the back of the boat, like that under which Jesus was said to be sleeping on the ballast sandbag during the, sto the story of the calming of the storm. Um, sometimes you'll see it and translated, at least in, in some English version of the Bible, you know, Jesus was asleep on the pillow. Um, putting it in, in cultural context, this was the ballast sandbag. Uh, and we, we store it under this little raised section of the boat at the back, and Jesus was having a kip on the sandbag at the back of the boat there. Uh, the boat uh, could accommodate some 15 people um, so there's no trouble with having room for Jesus and his 12 disciples all on the same boat as described in the Gospels. So interesting little, little points of coincidence between even just one you know, accidental find and what's described in the Gospels about the, the, the material culture that's being described there. And the fact that the Gospels get that right in a way that people who were say, writing in a different cultural context or in a different later historical period without access to Wikipedia, probably wouldn't have, have got right. And indeed, that's what you find when you turn to, say, the Gnostic Gospels, the later Gnostic Gospels, and you find uh, these mistakes about the material culture in them. Um, now, according to Jesus mythicist Robert M. Price, a major collision between the gospel tradition and archaeology concerns the existence of synagogues and Pharisees in pre-70 um, CE, common era, pre-70 AD, Galilee. Historical logic implies that there would not have been any since Pharisees fled to Galilee only after the fall of Jerusalem when the Romans attack in AD 70, destroy it. Um, destroyed it in AD 70. Well, 
here's a very recent find from December 2021. The University of Haifa announced the discovery of a first century CE synagogue in Magdala in Israel. They say, uh, although this is one of only a handful of synagogues from the first century ever excavated in Galilee, uh, it's uh, remarkably not the first uncovered in the ancient city of Magdala. Another synagogue was discovered in the city in 2009. This new synagogue, the latest find, helps scholars understand the deeply Jewish nature of Magdala and the Galilee as a whole in the first century, a subject that has been widely discussed and debated. Talking about that 2009, here's an article from the Smithsonian Magazine describing that discovery from 2009. Uh, the Gospels say that Jesus taught in synagogues throughout all Galilee. But despite decades of digging in the towns Jesus visited, no early first century synagogue had ever been found. Notice that and if you mount some skepticism because of that, you're making one of these arguments from an absence of evidence. But then some scholars argued that the, the synagogues in the New Testament were nothing more than anachronisms, like you find in the Gnostic Gospels. But as Israeli Antiquities Authority official uh, Dinah Avashalam Gorni, um, pictured here, stood at the edge of the archaeological dig pit, studying the arrangement of benches along the walls, she could no longer deny it. They'd found a synagogue from the time of Jesus in the hometown of Mary Magdalene. Uh, this is a particularly interesting um, bit of the find. You see the, the seating around the edge of the walls here and a pillar and, and this still standing um, sort of plinth. Um, in addition to various columns, the synagogue contained uh, several um, Jewish ritual bathing baths and mikveh and a beautifully uh, colored frescoes uh, and perhaps most stunning of all, this large stone that sat in the middle of the room, pos possibly functioning as a, a table to read the Torah from. Um, and it's uh, become known as the, the Magdala Stone. Etched into the stone are numerous images, including one of the earliest visual depiction of a menorah, the, the multi-candlestick, um, like one in, in, the, in the temple that's mentioned. And just a couple of quotes here from distant sources talking about this find marking the first case of the existence of two synagogues in any locality from the Second Temple period, from Jesus' era, um, when the temple in Jerusalem was still standing, contra what Price said. So let's turn to the, the finally this issue about Jesus, people's beliefs about Jesus, and a, a few more things that we can say about Jesus from the archaeological record. This is a, a quote from the Da Vinci Code. Uh, when they're talking about Jesus not being the Son of God. Uh, right, Professor T. Bing said, you know, Jesus' establishment of the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Um, this is what we English call poppycock. Um, let me introduce you to the, the third century church at Dura Europos, uh, described here, your courtyard, various teaching areas, some steps going up to the upper floor, where there's a baptistry in the upper floor. And around the walls of this baptistry are some wonderful pictures in the plaster work. Here's one of them. Let me just show you the picture first of all, uh, make it a little clearer. We have someone lying on a, on a bed, a bit of a wonky bed, someone lying on a bed, and someone carrying a bed. Looks like a bit of a hefty bed to be carrying, but there we go. So lying on a bed, carrying a bed, and, and Standing over the figure lying on a bed is a standing figure in a toga with an arm raised out over the person lying on the bed. And this is a kind of um, before and after picture, like you see in slimming magazines. Only it's before and after. What do you think it's before and after? Someone on a bed? Someone not on a bed? The raising of the paralytic. Jesus raising the, the saying, you know, get up and walk, lift up your bed and walk. Now that in terms of their culture at the time, the paint the, 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 the drawer of this, the painter of this, has taken this literally in terms of their culture, like bed, rather than 
bedroll, which was probably what you had uh, in, in the gospel situation. But that's what it's clearly portraying. And the interesting thing about portraying this scene that we know of from the gospels on the walls of a baptistry is what's the crucial thing about that story is that it is Jesus saying, yeah, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> you can't say that. You don't have the authority to say that. Oh, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say to someone, pick up your bed and walk? So it's a, it's a story that's all about Jesus' claim to do something that Jews in the first century would say only God could do. Here's uh, the version in uh, Mark 2, verses 3 to 12. I won't read the whole thing for you. Right over the baptistry is this picture, again, a little flaky here, but you can just about make out some pictures of sheep and someone carrying a sheep. There's the head of the sheep. There's the head of the person carrying the sheep, their legs and so on. Someone carrying a sheep. Why do you have a picture of someone carrying a sheep over a baptismal pool in a, in a church? Um, well, biblical imagery springs to mind um, from the Old Testament where God, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Imagery that then Jesus applies to himself in the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd. Who does this guy think he is? The Lord? Right? So uh, again, this picture brings to mind these resonances that have significance for who these people are may well have thought that Jesus was. Here's a, a mid-third century find, the Good Shepherd Ring. A gold ring with gemstone showing an image of a young Jesus holding a lamb on his back, a scene known as the Good Shepherd. Uh, one of several stunning artifacts found off the coast of Israel, some, some shipwrecks. Israeli Antiquities Authority announced it had recovered treasures from two shipwrecks dating back to 1700 and 600 years respectively, found in the ancient port of Caesarea. The ring, which is 1,700 years old, was found amongst a trove of third century Roman coins. So again, coins helping the dating. Another image of this good shepherd image from mid third century. Or here is a find from about 230 AD, so early third century, Christian prayer hall mosaic uncovered in the grounds of Megiddo prison when they were extending the prison there, discovered in 2005. You've got a kind of mock-up of what the building would have looked like with this communion table in the middle and um, these mosaics on the floor around it. And here's a top-down view of these mosaics, which will give you a, a close-up look of some of, because they're very interesting. Starting off with the fact that this mosaic has some picture of fish on it. Now, of course, we know historically that the fish became a symbol of Christianity fairly early on because the, the Greek word for fish, ichthus, was an early Christian symbol because you can make the acrostic where you take each letter of the word as the first letter of another word that spells out something significant. And you can get from ichthus, you can get what translates into English as Jesus Christ, God's Son, Saviour. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Saviour, the fish symbol. So maybe there's an indication in this fish symbol being used here uh, of who these people thought Jesus was. But if there's any ambiguity in your mind, let me point you to this um, fresco, uh, not fresco, a mosaic inscription, as it were, um, made out in the little tiles of the mosaic here. Uh, talking about the person who had all clearly like they funded um, some of the works and it says here the God-loving Akeptus has offered the table or the communion table to God Jesus Christ as a memorial to God Jesus Christ as a memorial 230 AD is that close up um, the Greeks um, didn't underline thing they they overlined things for emphasis. Um, God, Jesus Christ. Or the Aksaminos Graffito, which you won't be surprised to learn is uh, Latin for graffiti, uh, discovered on a wall near Palatine Hill in Rome, dating to about 200 AD. Someone in about 200 AD had just scratched some graffiti in, in this plaster work, probably maybe a Roman soldier taking the mickey out of another Roman soldier. 
And, and we've got here this, this picture of someone tied to a crossbeam, standing with a donkey's head. Whoever this is, you, you might say they made such an ass of themselves, they got themselves crucified. And this chap here is, is sort of looking up at this figure who's being crucified with, with his donkey head, raising up a hand. And the, the, the writing inscribed here uh, says, um, Alex Aminos worships his God. How oh, ridiculous. That's oh, so funny. He's worshipping a... Oh, oh He's worshipping a crucified guy. How stupid can you get, right? That's the, the cultural context of why on earth would you worship someone who was crucified? That is embarrassing, yeah? But around 200 AD, worshipped his God. Crucified. Who would we know that might, you know, that might be? Well, there's another clue in the fact that there's a donkey head here. You're thinking, why is there a, a donkey head here? Um, historian Tom Holland um, solves this for us. Um, he mentions in his uh, fascinating book from 2019, Dominion, he says, to Greek scholars, the question of what might be found within the Holy of Holies in the, the Jerusalem temple was a tantalizing <coughs> one. Poseidonus, never knowingly without a theory, claimed that it contained a golden ass's head. Others believed it held the stone image of a man with a long beard sitting on a donkey. So in the Greco-Roman mind, there's this association between Jewish worship of God and donkey imagery. And then we have the Alex Aminos graffito of somebody worshipping someone who got crucified who has a donkey head that he's treating as God. Fascinating, hey? The donkey imagery suggests, at least, that the God being worshipped here is supposed to be the Jewish God. And here's a little article from uh, Life Science um, from 2011. I'm afraid no picture to go along with this, but it's, it is interesting nonetheless. Researchers identify what they believed at the time to be the, the world's earliest surviving Christian or at least semi-Christian inscription. Uh, the technical term for which is uh, inscription NCE-156. Sounds like, you know, a USS Starship Enterprise, NCE or whatever. NCE-156, the inscription in Greek, dated to the latter half of the second century. Uh, alludes, at least, to Christian beliefs. It, uh, if it is, in fact, a second-century inscription, as I think it probably is, as this researcher, uh, Gregory Snyder of Davidson College in North Carolina, uh, is about the earliest Christian material object we possess. Snyder detailed the finding in the most recent issue of the Journal of Early, Early Christian Studies, believes it's a funeral epigram that incorporates both Christian and maybe some pagan elements the, the past is a different culture. So brace yourselves, I'm going to read you this funeral epigram. We wouldn't do things this way here, but the past is a different country. The inscription reads, To my bath, the brothers of the bridal chamber carry the torches. Here in our halls, they hunger for the true, you have to, what's the word there, true banquets, even while praising the Father and glorifying the Son. There, i.e. with the Father and the Son, is the only spring and source of truth. So you can see it's something about, okay, they've died, but they're going to a better place, and they're going to the source of truth, where they glorify the Father and the Son. The Pompeii, it's now called Rotas or Sator Square, um, dated 79 AD. Pompeii, you know, the town that was buried under the volcano uh, eruption. This square is found in ancient Roman places, including uh, Sirencester in England and Pompeii, dating to AD 79. It's a Latin uh, palindrome. It's written horizontally and vertically. Uh, it has a backwards spelling, Rotas opera tenet. Ah, Poe, Sator, 
uh, which translates from the Latin a farmer, something like, you get slightly different translations, but something along the lines of, farmer Arepo works the plow. But one may arrange the letters into the shape of a cross with the single letter N, maybe for the divine name at the center, at the center um, as it is in the square, and the words our Father in, in Latin, the opening of the Lord's Prayer, and the letters Alpha and Omega in Greek, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, at the end, horizontally and vertically. So you get this cross name, our Father, Alpha and Omega. Our Father, Alpha and Omega. Now, of course, according to Revelation 1.8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. The letters may be arranged into a prayer, Oro te pater, Oro te pater sanus. I pray to you, Father, I pray to you, Father, to heal. The symbolism is at least Jewish. Have a look at Ezekiel 1, 16 to 17 and 9, 4. Isaiah 46, 10. So the, the symbolism here may be Jewish and or Christian. Revelation 1, 8. So there's much discussion over, does this 79 AD find relate to and express Christian beliefs, or is it really just reflecting Jewish imagery from the Old Testament, depending on how you kind of read it? There, it's much discussed. But if we put these finds on a, on a nice timeline for us here, we have um, crucifixion here at 33 AD on the left, over on the right, 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea, and we have this spread of finds. Individually, I think they point to certain beliefs about that people had about who Jesus was, but particularly taken all together, there's a kind of cumulative case here about who people may have thought Jesus was prior to the Council of Nicaea. I mean, if we take the Pompeii Rotus Square as being Christian, that's only 50 years after the crucifixion. But that's debatable, right? Uh, if we go on to the NCE 156 imagery, uh, you know, glorifying the Father and the Son and so on, that's 150, 200 years after the crucifixion. Um, if we go on to um, the Acts of Minos Graffito, 8200, and the Mac Medigo Church and the Duro Rupos Church, 200, 230 years after the crucifixion. Um, but hey, that's still over a hundred years before the Council of Nicaea. So this claim that you know people only began to think of Jesus as, in some sense, you know, divine in the kind of Jewish Christian sense was only you know that's post Council that was made up at the Council of Nicaea stuff. You can just blow that out of the water by hundred years at least, just from looking at archaeology, not by you know, going to the pages of the New Testament where you know, I've, I've written articles you can find online at the College Journal um, from uh, the College I'm at with Norway. I wrote an article on um, uh, Christian beliefs about Jesus from the letter of James, which is a highly uh, Jewish Christian letter early, perhaps the earliest letter in the New Testament, which really expresses a very so-called high view of who Jesus was in a very Jewish context, that letter written by, I, I do believe, by James, the brother of Jesus as well, which is fascinating. But it, without going to that kind of literary evidence, just from what we happened to have stumbled over in the archaeology thus far, you can blow the, the Dan Brown kind of claim out of the water about this so-called late or evolutionary Christology. They started off thinking he was a man and he gradually becomes, you know, and, until in the fourth century he becomes divine. Even the Good Shepherd ring, that's still you know, 250 years after the crucifixion, but that's still decades before the Council of Nicaea. I, I said we'd look at um, some bones from a bone box. Uh, this is Johannan in 1968, ancient burial site uncovered containing about 35 bodies, one named Johannan ben Hagel. He has a seven inch nail driven through both feet. He was crucified. He was crucified and given an honorable burial, 
which some people have said about Jesus, oh, Jesus wouldn't have been buried because they wouldn't have given an honourable burial to someone who was crucified. Until recently, this was our only archaeological evidence of a crucifixion victim from an ossuary. He'd been given an honourable burial. Um, but in December 2021, again very recently, it was announced that the skeleton of a crucified man had been excavated from a grave at Fenstanton in Cambridgeshire in England. The remains had a nail driven through the back of the right foot, and radiocarbon dating tests suggested that the victim was executed in the 3rd or early 4th century AD. Probably, it was probably in about 250 AD. And here's his, the full, we've got a full skeleton this time, and a picture of the, the nail uh, through the back of his right foot. And again, another, our second archaeological find of a crucifixion victim, given an honourable burial. And this is later than that, that one I just showed you, but still. And remember, crucifixion is embarrassing. We saw this with the, the Alex Amino graffito, probably the earliest surviving depiction of, of, of Jesus. As, as skeptical New Testament critic Bar Ehrman says, it's highly improbable that the earliest Palestinian Jewish followers of Jesus would have made up the claim that the Messiah was crucified. <laughs> That, you know, that claim in itself in cultural context is a really good indication that that happened. And here we have a, a picture of it and why that's such an unlikely to be made up, culturally speaking. But then you have to explain, well, why have we got this picture? Why have we got those, those claims? Rob Bowman says it would never have occurred to anyone in the first century to invent a story about a crucified man as the divine savior and king of the world. It's not going to play on Palatine Hill, as we've seen. Something, therefore, something extreme and dramatic must have happened to lead people to accept such a embarrassing, ludicrous theory, culturally speaking. Hmm, what could that have been? That's the question. Uh, drawing to a close soon with just a few more uh, slides relating to Jesus and his uh, burial and maybe what happened after as well. This is Jesus' empty tomb. Dan Bahat, former city archaeologist of Jerusalem, says, we may not be absolutely certain that the site of the Holy Sepulchral Church is the site of Jesus' burial, but we certainly have no other site that can lay a claim nearly as weighty, and we really have no reason to reject the authenticity of the site. And a few years ago, they went through a big renovation of the buildings on the site, and, and of the, again, we have one of these church within a church within a church situations because of the, the history of the place. So mortar that was recovered during the 2016 renovation was dated to as early as AD 345, uh, which supports the traditional dating of the construction of the first church of the Holy Sepulchre to mark the tomb of Christ during the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine and his mother Agira that we quoted from earlier. Frederick Hybert, National Geographic's archaeologist in residence, quoted in an article as saying, um, this appears to be visible proof that the location of the tomb has not shifted through time, something that scientists and historians had wondered about for decades. And here we have a close-up of beneath the, the broken marble slab on top of the original rock surface of what is plausibly, the original burial place of Jesus. And then the Nazareth inscription, back to, we, we looked at the discovery of a house from first century Nazareth right at the beginning. And here we have a Greek inscription, very likely written during the reign of the Emperor Claudius. So that's about 41, 54 AD. And the interesting thing about this inscription is that it's, forbidding under penalty of death, which is an increase on the previously known punishment for this crime, forbidding under penalty of death, robbing bodies from tombs. Now, you know, the, the, what the Gospels say, the Jewish story about what happened to Jesus' body was, the disciples stole it. Right? And here we have an inscription from Nazareth, 
the known hometown of Jesus, upping the penalty early in the first century for tomb robbery, which is perhaps suggestive. It certainly makes sense in light of that Jewish argument about Jesus' body being stolen that's mentioned in Matthew 28. So, to summarize all three parts, and then we'll turn over to you guys again. Isn't it fascinating that just looking at archaeological evidence can indicate, no, I'm not saying prove with certainty, we're talking about history and historical judgment calls here, but indicate in the standard way that historical discussions in archaeology do, archaeological evidence indicates that Jesus, son of Joseph and brother of James, who was buried in Jerusalem in the middle of the first century, existed in the early middle first century. Jesus was crucified, which probably killed him. Um, a crucifixion victim could be buried. Jesus was buried, and was probably dead, therefore, um, in a now empty Jerusalem tomb, in, indeed a tomb that was marked as empty since the fourth century. Just outside where the first century city walls of Jerusalem would have been. Grave robbery was an offence that may have been particularly associated with Nazareth where the New Testament said that Jesus grew up by the mid-first century. Despite his crucifixion, his culturally embarrassing as heck crucifixion, Jesus was considered divine by some people within circa about 50 to 200 years of his execution. In the early 3rd century, about 200 to 230 AD, Jesus was clearly held to be divine in the Judeo-Christian sense, just from looking at the archaeology. Over a century before the Council of Nicaea, and the first century biographies, turning back to the literary, the primary literary evidence that we have collected together into the New Testament, have been repeatedly verified by archaeological discoveries that relate to places, people, material culture, people's beliefs, people's titles, people's relationships, uh, even from some of the archaeology you get, you know, son of so-and-so, brother of this, that, and the other, which should encourage us, I think, to trust those documents, those reports, on matters where we can't independently verify them in this way, because back to Lydia McGrew's argument about the bread, we've kind of randomly, through archaeology, tested it at so many places, and it keeps turning out to be good, so it would be being overly skeptical to say, yeah, but the bits that we happen not to have been able to test, they're probably all wrong, all right? I think this, this kind of creates at least a sort of... Uh, uh, a, a presumption of truth from repeated verification, you could say. <clears throat>